Thank you everyone for being here and welcome to our weekly seminar series. Today's speaker actually is our own, so it's a great pleasure for, for me to introduce our own Joe Barron. He actually has been a postdoc here for the last couple of years. Right? Yes, almost two years now. Yeah. Almost two years. And actually before, uh, before um, joining his, he got a PhD in physics at the University of Manchester, right? Correct. Under the supervision of Tobias. Also correct, yes. Yeah. Also correct, okay. So, and the title of the, the title of, the, of this talk today actually is Using Random Matrix Theory to Determine the Stability of the Generalized Local Star Equations. So, uh, thank you so much, Joe, for, for agreeing to give this talk. And the floor is yours. Thank you, and my pleasure. And uh, yeah, hello, everybody. Uh, yes, so I'll be talking to you today about a couple of very interrelated projects, which I began at the end of my PhD with Tobias, and we had some amount of uh, difficulty, and you will probably see why it was difficult for us to finally get the answer in the end, but with the help of a couple of uh, very enthusiastic and talented master's students, we managed to get there eventually. Um, so the talk will be roughly split into uh, two parts. So initially, I'll be talking about quite an abstract uh, mathematical problem to do with the eigenvalues of large random matrices with what I'm going to call generalized correlations. Uh, so this is quite a complicated technical problem and required us to develop some new analytical uh, procedures. Um, so I'm going to discuss with you how uh, a random matrix problem like this can be mapped onto a disordered dynamical system and how then we can use established field theoretic techniques to find the eigenvalue spectrum of this initial uh, random matrix. Okay, well, the, the title of the, the talk promised lots of Volterra systems. And so the second half of the talk, which will be related to the first half, I promise, um, will be discussing the, the generalized lock Volterra system. And what I'm going to discuss is the possibility of using random matrix theory to deduce the stability of this system. And what I will show is that previous random matrix results do not work um, and that we have to take into account higher order moments in this uh, random matrix ensemble in, in order to correctly predict the stability in the lock Volterra system. And this has to do with the so-called universality principle of random matrix theory. And I will go into uh, precisely what that is uh, later on. Okay, so just to kind of give a little bit of a recap or an overview of precisely what um, random matrix theory has to do with, for those of you who don't know, I'll start off with a very uh, simple example. So imagine that we have a very large uh, matrix, which is square and has a dimension N. And suppose that each of the diagonal elements of this matrix, we set this to minus one. Okay, so far so easy. But now imagine that we take each pair of um, off diagonal elements. So this could be one, two and two, one, mij and mji and we draw each of these um, elements from a joint gaussian distribution so one by one we go through all the pairs of the off diagonal elements of this matrix and we draw them from a gaussian distribution and they each of these pairs of elements has a, so each element has a variance which scales with one over n and the uh, the correlations have uh, this property over here so if, uh, if gamma is one, then this matrix would be symmetric. And if it was minus one, it'd be anti-symmetric. If gamma was zero, then um, these off diagonal pairs of elements would uh, be independent from one another. But the scaling with N here is particularly important because we need to be able to take um, the limit N to infinity in order to get analytical results from this. Okay, so that's the problem. And what's the, what's the solution? So, uh, what we find is that the eigenvalues of this matrix, uh, this large matrix M, these happen to be uniformly distributed in an ellipse in the complex plane, which I think is a, a rather surprising but very nice result. And so here's, here's an example over here. Um, and this has been known for, well, at least 25 years now, this, this kind of result, and it can be derived in a variety of, a variety of ways. So one can use replica techniques, cavity methods, all these, this plethora of techniques from uh, disordered systems theory. Um, the kind of technique that I'll be focusing on in this talk will be to do with the resolvent matrix, which I will, uh, I will define a bit better later. Okay, well, so this I would regard as the kind of most basic problem in London matrix theory. Um, but further complications can be added and further extensions to this problem can be uh, explored. 
So one such uh, extension would be the introduction of a, a non-zero mean to each of these uh, matrix elements. So everything else is the same. The variance of each element is still sigma squared over n. The correlations between pairs of off-diagonal elements remains the same. It's just that we've introduced this, this non-zero mean. Uh, this non-zero mean can be regarded as so-called rank one perturbation to the, uh, the previous example matrix. And what that means is that we're just adding a constant matrix to the, uh, the previous matrix. And what this results in is that the, the eigenvalues, of, well, most of the eigenvalues remain confined to the same ellipse, except one outlier eigenvalue, which now strays from the ellipse. And okay, I won't go into uh, precisely how this is calculated, but there, there is a, a very nice compact expression for this outlier eigenvalue, which I, I give on the screen here. And okay, so we're, we're moving up in years now. This was done in roughly 2014. So we're, we're moving steadily towards the present day here. Um, okay, so that's one particular extension, but people have been obviously in the, in the field of random matrix theory, exploring all sorts of different extensions to this problem. So instead of, use, instead of considering um, uh, fully uh, connected networks, let's say, or um, fully populated random matrices, we can instead consider sparse random matrices, which have a, a, a small number of elements per row, which are non-zero. And, uh, and, and this does not scale with n as we, as we grow the matrix. Uh, another possible extension to this problem would be to discuss block structured random matrices. We can look at matrices with, even with element specific variability and correlations and so forth. So this means that um, the variance of each random matrix element would be um, uh, given by sigma ij instead of just sigma squared. And we can go on and on and on. Um, but the extension I'd like to talk to you about today is something I regard as slightly more fundamental in a sense, which is that certain correlations between uh, random matrix elements, which uh, have been neglected in the past, we're, we're going to take these into account. Um, so the idea is this, okay, so we, we have a finite mean for each random matrix element. We have the same variance as before, and we have the, the correlations between um, uh, off diagonal pairs. But now what we're going to introduce is the possibility for correlations between elements which share a row, which share a column, and the, also these, these kind of funny correlations where we're kind of mapping one row onto one column and, and these, these elements will also be correlated. And notice that there's a different scaling with N here, and this is all in, in order that we can take a, a proper thermodynamic limit. Okay, and so the question is then, how do these, these new correlations affect the eigenvalue spectrum? Well, it turns out that once again, okay, so we still have an ellipse here, which is the, the same uh, kind of universal law that we've had all the time, we still have this, this same ellipse here. Um, however, the location of this outlier eigenvalue that we, we had previously from having this finite mean, this is now shifted. So the question is, how can we predict this, uh, this new outlier eigenvalue um, that comes about due to these, these new novel correlations? And this turns out to be a, a rather tricky um, uh, mathematical problem. And so the way that we attack this is by, okay, so we can start with the the usual outlier eigenvalue, uh, sorry, the usual eigenvalue equation. So this is nothing more than just the, the determinant of uh, the matrix, essentially. But I've decomposed the matrix into uh, three parts. So we've got the, 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 the minus one on the, on the diagonal here, and then we have the stochastic part and the, um, and the uniform random matrix, which, sorry, the uniform matrix, which represents the, the non-zero mean to each element. But all the randomness of the, of the matrix now is contained in this, this uh, matrix Z here. And the quantity that we're going to be studying in order to find this outlier eigenvalue now is something that we call the resolvent matrix. And we can use, after some linear algebra, we can take the original eigenvalue equation and we can use uh, something called Sylvester, Sylvester's determinant identity. And we arrive at this rather simple looking formula for the outlier eigenvalue in terms of um, the elements of this resolvent matrix. Okay, so the, the trick is if we can find the elements of this resolvent matrix, we can plug them into this equation and then we will find the outlier eigenvalue. However, this is not a, a simple thing to do because this resolvent matrix, okay, we're taking the average of the inverse of a random matrix. So 
this is a, a non-trivial thing to do and we have all these complicated um, correlations now in our, in our problem, so how on earth are we going to do this? So what we figured out was that what we can do is um, draw a correspondence with a, a dynamical system in order to do this. So it turns out that, okay, if we consider the following linear set of differential equations, um, so we're, we just have the, the random matrix J, uh, uh, the random matrix Z here, and we're exposing this uh, linear dynamical system to some external fields. Now, suppose that we uh, consider the response functions of this system. So we're looking at the response of um, one of these dynamic variables Xi to a perturbation in uh, the external field Hj. And one can, okay, we can take the derivatives fairly easy because this is a, a linear system. And we find that the response functions obey this, this set of equations. And if we take the Laplace transform and we do some rearranging, then what we find is that these response functions, well, the Laplace transforms of these response functions actually correspond exactly to the, the elements of this resolvent matrix from the previous slide. So now we've got this direct mapping from a dynamical system to the random matrix problem. Okay, so what's the use of this? Well, it turns out that we can use um, techniques from um, uh, disordered systems theory in order to find these response functions in a far easier manner, manner than we would be able to with the, uh, the resolvent matrix um, directly. Okay. And the way that we do this is with path integrals. And I have been merciful here, and I will not write out the complete expression for the path integral. But it turns out that these response functions can be written. So this, this derivative, sorry, this, uh, this measure here is uh, denoting an integral with respect to paths of the system. And we've introduced these, these conjugate variables. This, okay, this is not terribly important. Um, what is important is that the action with which, with respect to which we're, at, uh, we're averaging, this can be written as the sum of two parts. So the first part involves uh, terms which are proportional to the, uh, this capital gamma, which is the correlations between diagonally opposite elements, so we know all about this. However, the second part involves only terms which are proportional to these new correlations. So this is key. So we can separate out the, the one term which has these uh, correlations that we, we know lots about and our, our new correlations, which means that we can treat the new correlations as a kind of perturbation to the old correlations, which means that we can relate our, our new results to the to old results which are already known. Um, so the idea is that we expand the exponential in, as a series in, in this uh, S int. And once we perform the averages, what we find is that we obtain an expression for response functions of the, the new system with these, uh, th these new correlations in terms of response functions for the system without these new correlations, which are known in the literature. So, we'll, so we attain a series for R, I, J in terms of R naught, essentially, which we can evaluate. And after all of that, okay, so summing this series is not a, a trivial thing, but it can be done with the help of Feynman diagrams in the limit into infinity. And eventually what we obtain is this closed form expression for um, the response functions that we seek. And we know this expression for the, these so-called bare response functions. And if we use the, the, the correspondence of this resolvent matrix, um, uh, of, the, of the response functions to the resolvent matrix, we find uh, finally this, this expression for the outlier eigenvalue which is remarkably compact, I would say, and has uh, two nice features. So first of all, you'll notice that the only new correlations that appear in this uh, formula are these ones proportional to gamma. So only correlations between elements Mik and Mji contribute to the, uh, the difference in the location of this outlier eigenvalue. Um, so in row correlations don't matter and in, in column correlations don't matter. And a priori, I would say this is not obvious at all why this should be the case, but it, it turns out it is. Um, and also if we take the limit, um, gamma goes to zero. So if we um, take the limit where we have none of these new correlations, then we obtain the, the previous result. And of course we can check this with numerical simulations. And indeed, okay, so we can check this even more carefully. Uh, where we try lots of model parameters and of course we get this very nice agreement with um, with computational results um, but in particular so i've not had to use a gaussian distribution 
to generate these, these, these um, numerical eigenvalues. On the left um, figure here, we've used a uniform distribution for the, the, the matrix elements. And on the right, we've used a dicosmos distribution. And so, and, but the formula still works. So, so long as we have these correlations between the random matrix elements up to second order, then we given some caveats about the, the higher order moments, our prediction still works. And it's this property that's known as universality. And so we would, we would expect our, our formula to be very widely applicable um, to lots of different kinds of random matrix, even though they, they might not be Gaussian. Okay, so just to summarize that then. So what have we done? We found the eigenvalue spectrum of an ensemble of random matrix with essentially um, pretty general correlations between elements. Um, we've, the way that we took into account these previously neglected correlations is with uh, a kind of path integral approach where we were able to treat them as a perturbation to previous results. And we found that the, the correlations only between like elements Mij and Mki were the ones that affected this outlier eigenvalue. And if you want to read more about this, then uh, this happened to be published yesterday in PRL. Um, or you can go and see my poster in the hallway. Um, but okay, so the, the title of this talk promised uh, lots of Volterra equations, and I promise you all of this will, um, <laughs> this will apply to the lots of Volterra equations as well. Okay, so for those of you who are not familiar with the lots of Volterra equations, I'll give you a brief overview here. Um, so imagine that we have a community of species, which I label I, and there are n of these species in our ecological community, and we imagine that each uh, species has an abundance Xi, which can vary in time. And these abundances are determined by these uh, deterministic differential equations, which are coupled with one another, um, and these are the, these are the generalized lock Volterra equations. So you will note here that there is a, a logistic growth term and then also an interaction term between species. And we imagine that if the, the ecosystem is large enough, so if we have lots of species in our ecosystem, that we can just draw these um, interaction coefficients from some distribution. So this could be a Gaussian distribution, for example. And the statistics of these interaction coefficients can represent um, certain aspects of the ecological community. So the mean of these interaction coefficients, we can think of this as kind of a measure of the cooperation between species. Um, the variance of these interaction coefficients, we can think of this as like uh, a measure of the complexity of the interactions in the, in the ecosystem. And uh, the correlations between um, diagonally opposite um, interaction coefficients, this can be seen as a, a measure of the number of prey to prey relationships. So if, if gamma here were minus one, what that would mean is that the, the matrix is perfectly anti-symmetric, which would mean that always if one uh, species had a, a positive payoff, then the other species would have uh, a negative payoff. So you'd have lots of predator-prey pairs in your ecosystem. Okay. Um, so what do we see in this system then? So we have three observed behaviors. If we integrate these lock of Volterra equations forward in time, um, the system can approach a stable fixed point, or um, depending on the, the interaction statistics, we can see an unbounded growth of some species and lots of species will go extinct. So this is a, an unstable ecosystem. Or um, depending again on the interaction coefficients, we can see a kind of persistent oscillatory behavior where again, lots of species will go extinct and, but we, and the system will never reach a fixed point. And so the question then is, okay, so what sets of interaction statistics between species will lead to each of these behaviors? And well, so this has been done, of course, and this, is, this problem has been solved. And the way it has been solved is by using uh, so-called dynamic mean field theory. And uh, just to scare you, I will uh, show you how this is done. So the idea is that you start off with the, uh, the generalized lock of Volterra system to start with. And using um, a generating functional or a path integral approach again, or a cavity calculation, something like this, what one ends up doing is arriving at uh, a set of decoupled equations, which mean that we can, uh, we can make analytical progress. And so the idea here is that we have now a stochastic differential equation involving several order parameters. So here, eta represents uh, a Gaussian colored noise. And the idea is that, okay, so if I took this, this system here 
and I knew what each of these order parameters were so that this, they were defined self-consistently. Um, if I were to integrate these stochastic differential equations n times, I'd have an ensemble of trajectories, and this would be statistically identical to the original uh, lock of Altera system. And what that means is that I can use this uh, decoupled set of equations and make analytical progress. Um, these order parameters that I've written down at the bottom here, so the, the mean abundance of each species, uh, the response functions and the correlation functions between each species, these have to be determined. So these, these averages here are with respect to the Gaussian noise actually in this equation. So, yes, Amelia. Yes, I guess, Mark, you say that statistically, Correct, correct, yes. So, well, yes, so qualitatively speaking, you can imagine that each species is kind of interacting with a bath of the rest of the species. So you only, you can only understand the behavior of a single species as if it were interacting with the thermal bath of the rest of the ecosystem. So naturally, you're not really looking at interspecies correlations and, and things like this, um, if that makes sense. Uh, yes, and this turns out to be something of a problem. But, uh, well, OK. So once we have these order parameters and we have this, this effective single species process, what we can do is we can construct a phase diagram, essentially. Um, where we can find the sets of system parameters for which we see a stable fixed point. And if we were to cross vertically this uh, dotted line here, this is where we'd see the onset of these persistent oscillations. And if we cross the solid line here, then this is where we'd see uh, this unbounded growth of lots of different uh, species here. Um, okay, so this is a problem that has been solved, roughly speaking. And what we're going to do now is, so this has been done uh, with dynamic mean field theory. But let's see if we can uh, approach the same problem with a random matrix approach. And let's see, well, what we, what we find is that when we do this, we, we unearth some interesting properties about the surviving community of species. Um, and we reveal how these novel interaction statistics uh, affect the stability of these generalized lock of Altair equations. Okay, so, what we so the first observation that enables us to have a, a random matrix approach to this problem at all is the observation that the okay so the, the stability of the system is also determined by the Jacobian matrix of only the surviving species. So I won't prove this here, but it, it turns out to be true. And this what we're going to call the reduced Jacobian matrix takes the following quite simple form. So this is merely a product between a diagonal matrix with all the um, species abundances on the diagonal and um, what I'm going to call the reduced interaction matrix. So what J dashed is, is essentially, okay, I take the original interactions between all the species in the, in, in the pool of species, I run the dynamics and I delete rows and columns in this interaction matrix, uh, uh, which correspond to extinct species. And I end up with a smaller set of interactions in this surviving community of species. Um, and what we notice is that, well, so you can prove again that K dashed only has eigenvalues with negative real parts if and only if uh, J dashed also does. So this means that all we have to do is find out whether J dashed has eigenvalues with all negative real parts, and this will determine the instability of the system. So just to reiterate, I take the original interactions, I run the dynamics, I remove all the, element, all the rows and columns of J, which correspond to extinct species. And I look at the eigenvalues of this new interaction matrix or reduced interaction matrix, J dash. And this will tell me about the stability of the system. Okay, so how do I do this? Um, well, what we do is we construct this horrible looking uh, path integral approach, which I will, I will now explain. So this first exponential bracket, essentially what this is doing is enforcing the dynamics of the lock of Altera system. And we have a second term here, which we, which is a kind of source term, which means that if we take derivatives with respect to this, this factor lambda here, then we will be extracting the statistics of this reduced interaction matrix. So just to have a closer look then at this, this interaction term here, 
what we're what we're doing is we're multiplying the elements of the interaction matrix by um, heavy side functions. So any any species that goes extinct, theta goes to zero, and then this removes that element from the matrix. Um, so we can find all the statistics of this uh, reduced interaction matrix using this kind of approach, and we can evaluate them in terms of um, quantities from the dynamic mean field theory. So the response functions, the correlation functions, and the mean abundance that we would get from the effective process that I showed you a few slides back. And well, this, this was quite successful. Um, and what we find is that, okay, so um, by looking at this um, new reduced interaction matrix, um, the statistics of the interactions between species are modified by removing the, the rows and columns corresponding to extinct species. And this is to be expected because which species go extinct will depend on their interactions with all the rest of the species. So it's this kind of feedback, right? So as we alter all the different interactions between the initial pool of species, so that would be sigma squared on the bottom here, the, the, the new interactions between the surviving species are also modified um, differently. And very importantly, what we see is that we get additional correlations between elements in the, in the matrix in the surviving community, which were not there in the initial matrix. So now we're seeing correlations between JIJ and JKI, which were not there in the initial community. And so this was the sort of the inspiration for our previous, uh, what we we're doing in the start of the talk, where we're looking at the effect of these additional correlations on the, on the eigenvalue spectrum. Okay, so now let's, you, let's try and take these statistics that we've computed and see if we can find the eigenvalue spectrum of this surviving community. Okay. So once again, I have an ellipse here, and this is well predicted by um, the usual theory. So I take the modified variance and the modified correlations between diagonally opposite elements in our matrix J dashed, and this predicts very well the, the bulk spectrum. Okay, so that's great. Well, okay, so now if I try and predict the outlier, well, I take one naive prediction over here, and this doesn't appear to work, even though I'm using the correct modified statistics. And if, even if we use the, the nice formula that we came up with in the first part of the talk, this also doesn't work, despite the fact that it appeared to be a universal law for the outlier eigenvalue. So what's going on here? How can we find the actual outlier eigenvalue of our reduced interaction matrix? So just to reiterate, in our first, in this expression that I write at the top here, this takes into account all the possible correlations between um, elements in the Gaussian random matrix. And if we're to believe universality, then this should apply to this eigenvalue here as well, but it doesn't. Um, so in order to find this, we have to take into account higher order statistics. And the way that we do this is that we, okay, we go back to the resolvent matrix and we, we can write, we can expand this out as a big long series. And what we, what we can do is we can use our um, expression for the generating functional that I wrote down earlier, which if I take derivatives with respect to lambda, then I pull down factors of this reduced interaction matrix, and I build, I build this series. And from this series, okay, I can relate this. So each of these elements in this series will be written in terms of um, quantities from the dynamic mean field approach, so correlation, these correlation functions and, and so forth. And eventually, I will arrive at an expression for this outlier eigenvalue um, once I sum up this series. Okay, so that's definitely a, a very quick summary of what the calculation entails. But so at the end of it, okay, we find a nice neat expression, roughly speaking, for the outlier eigenvalue, where this factor G here satisfies a cubic equation. Um, I'm not expecting you to absorb this at all, of course, but merely just to show you that it can be written down reasonably succinctly. Um, and the point is that this, so this outlier eigenvalue now is written as an expression in terms of quantities. So here we have the mean abundance of species at the fixed point. We have um, the correlations between species, sorry, the, the variance of species at the fixed point, the, the fraction of surviving species and response functions and so forth. So we've, we've found an expression for the outlier eigenvalue in terms of all of these quantities, which we can find from, um, from mean field theory. And indeed, uh, this works very nicely now. So um, we can measure this outlier eigenvalue in um, computer-generated random matrices, and clearly it's working very nicely. 
And particularly nicely as well is that we can prove analytically that this outlier eigenvalue, when it crosses the imaginary axis, this corresponds to the onset of um, instability in our system, which is what we set out to do in the first place. Um, but in particular, so if we now compare this more thoroughly to um, Gaussian random matrix uh, predictions, we see that this clearly this is very different um, to, the, to these supposedly universal um, previous predictions. So what we've shown here is that the full statistics really have to be taken into account in order to correctly predict stability here. This is an important message for ecologists who are always looking at Gaussian random matrix results and they're always just looking at these kind of lower order moments and invoking this universality principle um, to, to justify the using these simpler results. But what we're showing here is that this universality principle really doesn't work. And this is quite a nice non-contrived example, I would say, of where this, this isn't working. Um, we're not having to use any pathological distributions or anything like this. It, it simply doesn't work in this, in this example. Okay, so just to summarize then. So we studied the stability of the, the generalized lock of Volterra equations by studying only the eigenvalues of the interaction matrix between the surviving species. Um, and then we found that this, this eigenvalue spectrum is not correctly predicted by um, Gaussian random matrix results. And we found that high order moments had to be taken into account in order to correctly do this. Um, and the way that we found the, the correct formula for the outlier eigenvalue is by using uh, dynamic mean field theories to find the, the statistics of this reduced interaction matrix. And if you'd like to read more about this, then this is in our archive paper, which was published uh, towards the beginning of this year. Uh, and that's all I have to say. So thank you for your attention. For the very interesting talk. Uh, we have time. Uh, oh, I went quite quickly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was oh, okay. nice. Oh, okay. So we have time for questions. As usual, I encourage the PhD students, and I see a lot of them here, but also online. Mm -hmm. This time we don't know, it's not a PhD student, but all the other ones. <laughs> so I really encourage students or here or online to start with the with questions. If you are online, just uh, unmute yourself and start speaking. We have the first question. Let's say it's someone online. Okay, no? Okay, we have a question here. Tell me. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, the problem is that We, we could share my microphone, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. Not optimal. Uh, okay. I don't know if they were there before the talk. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. If there are online questions, please start. And then while we are going to the uh, microphone. So if you're online, don't be shy. Just unmute yourself and start. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. Thank you for the talk, Joe. I can make the question while you find the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Um, I just was wondering if you have an idea of the uh, physical meaning for the outlier eigenvalues to predict the on-site of instabilities. Uh, yes. So, well, do we mean physical or do we mean ecological? Um, uh, ecological, of course. <laughs> um, okay, so Woo. yes, I rather skipped over this a little bit, but it turns out that so we have our our phase diagram over here, and I, I hope you can still see this. Um, <clears throat> so when we cross this dotted line here, this turns out to correspond to the the see? ellipse of the eigenvalue spectrum crossing the imaginary axis. So if if when, so it turns out that the radius of this ellipse uh, is related to sigma squared here. Um, as we increase sigma squared, the ellipse will eventually cross this, um, this dotted line here, the imaginary axis. And that corresponds to this line here in the phase diagram. However, the outlier eigenvalue here 
if this crosses the, the axis here, so this corresponds more to, okay, if we're increasing the, the mean of the interaction matrix element, um, so the, going in this direction in the phase diagram. So when, when the outlier eigenvalue crosses the imaginary axis, that's when we cross here on the phase diagram. So the outlier eigenvalue can be thought of as kind of corresponding to more collective behavior, um, this exponential uh, diverging abundances, whereas the, the bulk of the eigenvalue spectrum can be more related to this oscillatory behavior in, in the abundances. Does, does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Oh, now that we have the microphone, we can move to the, let's say, to the presidential question. So, well, thank you, Joe, for the nice presentation. I, I have two uh, very naive questions because I just reached the surface of your work. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> the first one, if, uh, if uh, regarding the first part of your presentation, if I was given to, let's say, di diagonalize a random matrix. Mm -hmm. And I have to learn how to do these path integrals of yours and, and these things. How uh, good is this method regarding other methods in the literature to diagonalize matrices, let's say, in terms of efficiency or things like uh, that? Well, okay. So there, there do exist uh, numerical methods, of course, to diagonalize large matrices. Um, I suppose the point of the analytical approaches which okay th these require an, uh, an awful lot more um kind of intellectual effort i suppose um the, the point of these is that well first of all i can take the thermodynamic limit so i'm really looking at n to infinity whereas of course you, you will only ever be approximating the thermodynamic limit with a large random matrix so that's one thing but the Using a, an analytical approach, you obtain a closed form solution for your the eigenvalues of your random matrix, and this will give you a, a, a tremendous amount more physical insight into what is actually um, giving rise to instability in your system. So, what as, what statistical what statistical aspects of the system um, promote instability in your system? I think this is only a question that can be answered efficiently. Um, in, in an analytical way. So, I mean, of course, you could, you could make lots of random matrices, diagonalize them numerically, and then go, okay, well, variance in the random matrix elements, this seems to promote uh, instability, but a closed form an analytical solution, I think, can really, can really um, decompose what the, the crucial aspects of the, the statistics of interactions between um, species, say, really gives rise to instability. So that would be my answer to that. Um, yeah, and, and regard, thank you very much. And regarding the, the second part of it, I, I didn't get the, what was the point of this reduced matrix, which you, you have to make evolve the system and then see which species got stinted. Yes. So you are, I guess that you are not solving the dynamics completely, no? Or how is it going? Because then you can compute everything on that. No, I, 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 don't, I don't get the point. Okay, so... Let me find the slide. This was on it. This was here, wasn't it? Yeah. So we're talking about here. So, oh God, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Let me try again. I'll press the right button this time. Okay, good. Right, so, so you're asking, why is it that we have to remove extinct species from this matrix in order to, so what, why are we doing this? Is that, is that what you're asking? Yeah, I'm, I'm, it, it will be two questions. If, why are you doing it? And then why this is not giving you the entire picture of what is happening? If, if you are making the system evolve and you're integrating all the equations, then what is the information that you are getting uh, from there? that right, you don't yeah. have from the direct integration of the of Okay, the I, completely, I completely agree with you. So we're not, what we're not doing is finding, um, like we've already found the phase diagram. We know from dynamic new field theory, um, what the kinds of interactions in the original system, uh, what, what kinds of interactions there give rise to instability. What we're doing um, in, in this approach is what is we're, we're understanding 
Okay, so you, in, in an ecological situation, you, you're not looking at the initial pool of species. You know, you're not looking at this uh, J without the dashed. You're looking at the surviving community. And so in the, by using dynamic mean field theory, okay, you're, you're finding what interactions between the initial, original community give rise to instability. But by taking our approach, what we're finding out is what interactions between the surviving community, which is what you would actually see in nature, what interactions between those survivors give rise to instability. So we're, we're, we're looking at, um, so we're, we're, we're able to deduce what the, the uh, statistics of this surviving community are, and then using random matrix theory, then so that you, you get stability or instability of the various system parameters. Although, does, are we on the same page now? <laughs> Not really, because I don't, I don't understand why you cannot extract this information from the... I mean, <laughs> I see everything as a numerical problem, kind of, no? I mean, okay, if yeah, you are yeah. computing everything and you are already integrating all the dynamics, Mm -hmm. which information is hidden, let's say, from the integration of the... For me, if you integrate the equations, you have the entire... I mean, you, you can compute everything, no? Or not. This is, this is what I don't understand. I mean, you have the initial condition, no? That is the matrix in the, in the left. Then yeah. you integrate everything and get the matrix in the right. And once you have that matrix, you start to compute things out of it, no? Yeah. If I understood properly. And yeah. then I don't understand which information are you extracting from, from this second part of computing things out from this second matrix that you didn't have before. This is, this is my, it's very naive. I'm, I'm really <laughs> trying to, to understand what well, you'll be finding properties of the surviving community, and it turns out that you can find, you can deduce whether or not the system will be stable by looking at the the properties in this this surviving community. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. And you only okay, have to, okay, yeah, and that's yeah. all you have to look at mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in order to deduce stability. So mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. the kind of the main point of this slide, I suppose. Um, yeah. Is, is that, yeah. 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 Okay. I, 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 I okay. understand. Thank you. I think actually we have time for, for example, one more question. I don't know. Sir? No, no, everyone. Now, now everyone can, <laughs> can ask questions. So I don't know. Emilio has one. Someone online? No? Okay. So, Emilio. Yes, I, I have a couple of questions. Let's remain in this, in this, uh, this slide. Okay. Uh, what, uh, I think this is very interesting uh, because just uh, just um, say that the surviving interaction matrix has a statistical pro statistical properties which are different from the original one. Correct. Uh, can, can you say something ecological from looking what are the interactions that survive? I mean, you, you are identifying with this uh, here. What is the statistics of the surviving species? Mm -hmm. So is this can is telling this something to? what are the important species or anything ecological about the original system? Yes, okay. So I think perhaps the, the next slide might be the best for this, uh, or, the, or the one after, rather. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so, well, for example, so, I mean, well, we find that, so from graphs like this, we can see what happens to the original community in, in, the, in the long run. So, for example, we've started off here with a, a mean um, of, the, of the interaction matrix elements, which is 0 0.6. And we're seeing that for various degrees of complexity, this is going to be altered in, in various ways. But typically, okay, apart from this, this part of this curve here, we're, go, we're seeing that uh, cooperation tends to rise in the surviving community as opposed to the original community. So we're seeing species that were below average in... Um, cooperativeness, let's say, or the, or the most disagreeable species, they're, they're the ones that seem to go, go extinct. So we, we can deduce this kind of thing from our, our approach, if, if, if that's what you're asking. So um, there are, yeah, there are certainly many um, 
many conclusions you can draw about which species survive from this kind of, kind of approach. I think that exploring this will be very interesting from the ecological point of view. I think so, yeah. 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 And it is underexplored as well, because, well, um, I think I think I've only really read one paper which seems to take into account these kind of modified statistics, especially these kind of um, novel statistics between um, uh, non-transposed pairs of matrix elements and so forth. And any discussion about these kind of higher order statistics is largely neglected. I, I think predominantly because it's it's difficult to deal with, you know, but. Um, yeah, I think, I think there's an awful lot to explore there. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. The second question, can you go to the, the last slide of the, of the first part? So when, when you yeah. are yeah. dealing with the, the you, you want, yes, when you talk about universality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you say, I mean, I understood properly the two, uh, the two plots are the, is, are the same, is the, the outlier as a function of gamma in both cases. Correct. And there is universality, but I see that the that the curves are completely different. So, so oh. in which sense, <laughs> uh, in which sense is universality? I mean, in one case, one the, the outlier decreases with the gamma, and the other increases. So, could yes. you explain a little bit more? Sorry, sorry. Yes, no, I, I understand. Yes. So, what I said was perhaps the way I've presented the information here is perhaps confusing. I'm not suggesting that these two panels, by comparing them, we ought to be able to see universality. That's not what I'm suggesting. What I'm suggesting is that, okay, so the, the theory line here is computed using a Gaussian theory. And yet the numerical results, which are produced using non-Gaussian matrices align with this theory. But the, uh, in both panels. So in the left, you use a Gaussian to obtain the, the lines and Correct. the dots are from a uniformly distributed. In the right, what are the lines? The same Gaussian, Gaussian? Gaussian yes. The same one? Mm, they're, they're not, not the same lines, obviously, but um, the, it's the same theory that produces the lines. So, what is the difference between the what is what what are, what is the ingredient which is different in the two cases? Oh, we've changed the the system parameters. So here, mu is minus one point two, and on uh, the right, it's okay. it's positive. Okay. Sorry. Yes, you're right. There we go. We we could have presented the information better. But, okay. Thank uh, you. I don't know if we have more questions from the, let's say online here. Okay, so last question, unless we can. <laughs> uh, well, my question is also a bit uh, naive maybe <laughs> because I'm not very familiar with the topic. Uh, in this first part, uh, you explained that in order to find this outlier, you map the problem into a dynamical system mm -hmm. and then you, used a path integral approach to find a, a response function. But I don't understand why using this path integral and finding this response function is giving you information about the specific eigenvalues, okay. the, the outlier eigenvalues. Yes. Um, so I, I don't think that's a naive question at all. Um, so I think probably the slide that we want is over here. So. <clears throat> Yeah, so it, it turns out that in order to find the outlier eigenvalue and the um, this ellipse to which most of the eigenvalues are found, one has to take slightly different approaches. Um, the outlier eigen, well, so both of these things, this ellipse and the outlier eigenvalue, can be related to this resolvent matrix. This is typically the um, the central object in these calculations, this resolvent matrix. Um, so what we kind of prove on this slide is that the outlier eigenvalue, which is given by lambda here, this can be found from this formula. So we can prove that we, we can use this resolvent matrix to find the outlier eigenvalue. And then in the subsequent slides, I show that this resolvent matrix can be related to these response functions, and then we find the response functions, and then, and then we find the outlier. Right? Um, in principle, we could also use the same approach to find this ellipse. So we, we could um, find the response functions of, of, of the system, and then we could use a different formula. So not this one here, which is only for the outlier eigenvalue, but we would we'd actually be taking the trace of the resolvent matrix. Okay, technical detail. But you could also use the same approach to find 
the rest of the eigenvalue spectrum in principle. Um, so is, is that answering the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay, I, perfect. I understood it now. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I think that we can close here the seminar. So thank you again, Joe, for the for the interesting talk. My pleasure. And guys, see you next week.